Good evening and welcome to the 332nd meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and the history of text and image work. The series is sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight is Adrian Seville, uh, who is um, calling in from Cambridge, England, or just outside. He's an international expert on the history of printed board games and specializes in the research uh, on the cultural history of the game of the goose. This research is supported by his private collection assembled over many years. And now uh, the collection is destined for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I just asked him, where are the great collections of board games in England? And he said, well, in my home, or he, you have the big collection. He has published widely on printed board games and uh, spoke about them in Europe and America. In 2016, he curated a public exhibition of his collection at the Gralia Club in New York. Uh, his recent book, The Cultural Legacy of the Royal Game of the Goose, was published by Amsterdam University Press and is the first comprehensive academic study of the genre. He is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London. And his speech tonight is entitled The Game of the Goose in the Cartoon Idiom. So thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be online. Uh, Cambridge is more or less on the Greenwich Meridian, so it's midnight here. And if I go to sleep, you'll probably notice, whereas if you go to sleep, I probably shan't. I've been interested in goose games for many years, and I've noticed that there are some which are actually produced in the cartoon idiom. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you a short introduction to the game and its variants, which are many. And then I'll switch over and tell you about five cartoonists who have used cartoons to produce their own versions of the game of the goose. And you'll want to know what it looks like. Yeah. This is the earliest surviving British goose game, dates from the middle of the 17th century. The game itself is a lot older. It goes back to the 15th century. It's recorded in Italy, and it must have been popular because the record is of people trying to ban it as a gambling game. But what we shall see is that it has many variants and many guises. Let's just stick with the basic game for a minute, though. It's a spiral race game. You start up here at the bottom left, and you race with double dice, trying to get to the winning space in the middle at the bottom of the oval there, number 63. And if you want to know why it's called the game of goose, just zoom in and you'll see that there are many geese. When you land on a goose, you double your throw forwards. If you're going forwards, if you overshoot at the end, you have to count your excess point backwards. And that could land you on a goose. In that case, you double your points backwards. So it's a really well constructed and very fast and furious game. But it's not so easy to get to the winning space because there are various hazards on the way. I show two here. Uh, up top right, you see the inn, 
where you waste time, you have to miss some turns. And then at 52, the other arrow is the prison. And there you have to wait until somebody releases you and they take your place. The bottom half also has hazards. You'll see on the right, the, the labyrinth or maze, you've lost your way and you have to go back. At the left, number 31, we have the well. That's a bit like the prison. If you're in the well, you have to stay until somebody gets you out. When I did my Grolia exhibition, I had a special function dinner where everybody sat around tables and played on reproduction versions of this game. And it was nice to hear all the wealthy Groliaites saying, get me out of the well, I'm in the prison, get me out, and so on. Because the game is quite fun, at least for an hour, and after an hour they wanted to drink. So we have a lot of numbers. I don't expect you to, to know all these numbers, but the, the one in red is important. That's the death space where you start again. And these numbers would be known by every child, every adult in France, in uh, Italy, in Germany, particularly in the Netherlands, uh, say from the 18th, 19th, and the early part of the 20th century. And this game has proliferated with many variations. And I'm concentrating tonight on the variations which tell a story. Here's one from the early 18th century, talking about the Navy, the sailing ship Navy. And it's a beautifully produced game, uh, produced by uh, careful copper engraving. And when we look at it more closely, we can see uh, just how nice it is. You can imagine that if you were a boy uh, at, in this time, you might think it was a good reason to join the Navy in France. And it does tell a sort of story because at the bottom left, we see uh, the embark em embarkation at the seaport. And then up there at number 63, again, we see we've reached Good Harbour. And we have things like a goose space. There on number 36, where I've got the green arrow, you have a following wind and you double your, your throw. And if we look at a different area, we can see some hazards, which are like the game of goose. There on the right, we see that the ship has run aground on a shoal and you have to wait just as you would for the well or the prison till somebody comes to help. And then number 58, the worst event is shipwreck, where you have to start again. So these variations were on a whole number of themes, mostly education at the beginning. So we had geography, history, arts of war and so on. And then it moved in France into uh, much more uh, socially um, adult areas, uh, such as theater, uh, fashion, whatever. Almost any human activity, there's a game based on the game of goose, more or less uh, covering it. But you'll see this game doesn't really tell a story, not in the same sense as a, a strip cartoon. What you have is a lot of interesting information, interesting pictures, different sorts of ships, uh, sailing terms, all of these things, but it doesn't tell a unified story. And you might think it was a, a natural to have stories on games like this, and you'd be right. And here is one. This is a century later, also French, the royal game of the life of Henry IV. Now, Henry IV is a 16th century monarch in France, 
and we'll see why he is being uh, the subject of a game at this time. Let's look at the how the story develops. Starting at number one, we obviously have his birth. Number two shows Henry as a, a boy playing with the, the local young children of the village. He's then declared as head of the church. He, uh, his mother dies. Uh, there's a picture of Henry himself. And then he gets married. And a bit later on, number 52, uh, there he is. He's uh, on horseback and he gives a, pre a peasant uh, a ride who wanted to meet uh, the king. Number 53, there's a, a nice story about him going incognito uh, to uh, a country countryman's house and wanting to eat. The countryman sends out next door for a turkey and the owner of the turkey says, I must come too. And so amuses the king that the king gives him, um, uh, uh, ennobles him and gives him a, royal, a coat of arms consisting of a turkey with a spit through it. But that's not all. We expect on number 58 some idea about death. And there indeed is a, a trial where the Marshal de Biron is condemned for treason. And we also see, actually on the goose spaces, various pictures of people who are very much not part of the 16th century. They are the modern uh, royalty of the House of Bourbon, and it, the royalty has just been reintroduced uh, after the French Revolution. And this is actually a piece of none too subtle royal propaganda, saying here is this good king, he's known in fact for saying every Frenchman should have a chicken in the pot, and he's helped peasants, he's played with the villagers, he's a really nice chap, and all these minor royalty are really nice too. So we have a piece of propaganda in the game. It ends rather curiously, the death space for Henry is on 61, he's actually assassinated, which you might think a good king wouldn't necessarily be. But it's all fine. After his uh, funeral, number 63, he ascends to heaven. So there we have a story with a story of a life with a happy ending and probably rather uh, a, 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 a sort of life that is not quite lived in the way that the game says. So we have uh, games that produce a story and it's hardly surprising that cartoonists would be interested. So that's the end of my introduction, and we can now look at some cartoonists. Probably you won't have heard of them, but they are actually in their own country all famous. Fernand Fell, perhaps less, Gus Bofa, definitely, Hoxma in the Netherlands, in, indeed famous, Jacobiti in Italy, and George Walensky, you probably heard because you know how he died. But let's have a look at them in turn. Here's Fernand Fo, very, very stylish, a nice photograph, obviously dressed up for the occasion. And let's look at some of his cartoon work before we start looking at his game. Cartoon produced for the humorous journal Le Rire in Paris, 1895. The gentleman who's just come in from the races, you can see there his binoculars, and he says he'd like a fine champagne. He'd like a, well, a fine champagne, but could also be interpreted as a small champagne. And that's what he gets. If you look closely, you'll see that he has a very small glass. And he asks where, the waiter, where is this? Where's my glass? 
And the waiter says, you've got it there. And he says, where the devil is it? Ah, and he takes out his binoculars and there you see the glass produced to its, uh, a good size together with his hand. And he says, it really was a fee shampoo. This is another side of Fernand Faux. Le Chat Noir is uh, much more of an avant-garde uh, magazine, also Paris, 1897. And here is the gentleman finds the lady of the night underneath the lamppost. They agree terms and up the stairs they go. She locks the door. He helps her to undress getting a good eyeful as he does. Everything is discreetly hidden behind a screen and she comes down and there she is again under the lamppost. And it's rather uh, acerbically titled A Page of Love. And indeed, that must have been really quite dramatic at the end of the 19th century. So how does Fernand Faux bring his um, expertise to the game of the goose? Well, it's by telling a story. And it's the story of La Grande Therese. And there she is. And the game is titled The Game of the Rabbit of Grande Therese, 1903, Le Jeu du Lapin. And we'll have a close look at it. It tells a story and I've written it down in case you find it easier to read than listening to me. Therese was a peasant girl from the south of France and she married the son of the mayor of Toulouse. And after that, she began to tell the tale that she'd helped a wealthy American who had been taken ill on a train and he had promised to give her a rich inheritance. There was a letter that the fortune was contained in a safe that was to be unlocked when Therese's sister was old enough to marry one of his nephews. And she borrowed large sums of money from a whole range of people who thought they would be well rewarded when this safe was opened. And she enjoyed the high life in Paris for 20 years. But eventually, the creditors got a court order, the safe was unlocked and it contained nothing of value. She escaped to Spain, was apprehended, but brought to trial in France where she got hard labor and her husband and the brothers who had posed as the nephews were also convicted of fraud. That's the story. Let's see how Fernand Faux tells it. We start at the left. There is the bag of money, a hundred million. I'm not going to go through every uh, every um, uh, uh, every square because that would take too long. But look along to number five, <clears throat> and we have a rabbit, and that is in the place of the goose faces, and <clears throat> the rabbit is at that stage quite normal, just a white rabbit eating some greens. At the end of that top row, you see one of the uh, Crawford nephews, who is uh, actually not. It's one of uh, Therese's brothers. But the, the, the nephews keep appearing to give a, uh, some sort of credulity to the story. When we go on, uh, underneath at number 32, there is the rabbit, but it's now dreaming of gold. And so it's turned a yellow gold color. And then we have the opening of the safe. And at number 35, um, all you find inside is just a little button, which has in fact the words uh, that uh, gold is just a fiction. Now the rabbit 
is very disappointed and it's turned green. And there's the, the family trying to escape. Um, and we see what happens next. They're caught and brought back to trial. And at number 58, I told you to keep an eye on 58. That's the death space. Start again. And it shows the French judge's hat, the toque, uh, trapping the rabbit. And then everybody wants a piece of the rabbit, served up to dine. But there are too many gentlemen who, who want a piece of the action. And so at the end, we see the rabbits uh, dancing around the golden calf, which is actually marked Panama, because there was also a Panama scandal of uh, uh, Panama Canal shares and the canal never got bought. So here we have a game which is telling a good story in a cartoon idiom, but we can also see there is the arrest uh, in prison. Therese and her husband got five years, the Crawfords got two or three years, the nephews. But this is a game which is not being taken seriously by the inventor. It says here uh, that the, the, the game, which is made up of 63 numbers, that's the normal number, is played with two dice without pips. In other words, he's not taking the game seriously. The game is a, con cons a conversation piece of satirical uh, nature. We move on to a darker side, Gus uh, Bofa. And Gus Bofa uh, served in the war, Great War, and got ideas then for this book, which is the game of the Hundred Years' War, which is a medieval war. But you can see it's very much uh, using uh, graphics that come from the First World War. On the left, uh, there is the, uh, the, the, the soldier, and the soldier says, oh, it, what would really please the people who sell prints uh, would be that I rape the servant. And in the book, we find this wonderful picture. We do have some speech bubbles here. Um, this is a piece of artillery, and this is French artillery. Uh, they say that uh, only yesterday we dealt with six English, and the English on the left are saying uh, caricature, cartoon type things like, uh, too short, here yeah, boys, um, and so on. But what about the games? Well, this is the magazine that was circulated in the trenches in the Great War, the bayonet. Uh, the cover design here is by Paul Irib, who was a, a noted artistic designer. Um, but the game itself is a, a centerfold. And here it is. It's uh, the, the game of the, the, the trenches. And at the left, it says Pan Am. That doesn't mean the airline, I have to say. It, it's uh, Argot or slang for, for Paris and probably relates to the Panama uh, scandal that I talked about earlier. Now, the good spaces, the goose spaces, um, you'll see. Um, I've marked them with arrows, but they're really all the same. Uh, it's all cheap wine. Vin ordinaire, the pinard, some of it red, some of it white. But the only favorable thing is drink. And it says here um, the game begins at number one ends at number 36, where there's a German trench. Um, and that's uh, where you're trying to get. But to play, 
you need both players and some dice. And it's easier to find dice than it is to find players. The players will benefit from in, an indemnity during uh, dear life and from <laughs> La Semaine Anglaise, the five day working week. So we have a piece of pretty heavy satire considering that the readers are fighting in the trenches. Now, what I've said is when in a goose game you overshoot, you use the extra points to count back. Here, he's uh, varying that by saying there's no solution. If you get past that trench with that German trench, you're in a ridiculous situation and there's no way out. And just to show even more clearly that he's satirizing the game as well as the war. Look at number 31. The uh, th number 31 is a sort of mobile rifleman who goes round the battlefield sniping away. And he said, says that anybody who arrives there will go three times round the game, pushing the dice round with his foot like children do when they're playing hopscotch. He'll then come back to his place, but he can leave at once if he thinks the game is stupid. So again, a satirical take on uh, the goose game. <clears throat> I couldn't find a picture of Dan Hoeksma, at least not one that I was certain. And so I thought, I would show you what fame means for a cartoonist in Holland. This is the relatively new town of Almere, and Dan Hoeksma has a whole street named after him, Dan Hoeksma Street. <clears throat> I'll show you, I think he's a great designer, actually. Um, this is a, a design for some uh, songs uh, at St. Nicholas time uh, in Holland. St. Nicholas really takes the place of Father Christmas. Santa Claus, St. Nicholas, on a different date, on the 6th of December, the children put out shoes and uh, St. Nicholas comes to the good children and gives them presents. And here it's a hoop and stick. The little girls put out her, her, uh, her shoe and there is St. Nicholas shaking hands with the little girl. I think it's charming. But he does also things like this. This is an early cartoon by Hoeksma, uh, the painter uh, of the wall. And the little boy thinks it's a good idea to uh, caricature the painter and does so in black. And the painter comes, grabs him, and the painter paints the little boy red. And the thing I really like about this cartoon strip is uh, not the human participants, but the chicken. The chicken which sees it all, flies off, peers round the corner, and then says, gosh, with its beak open, what does he look like? But let's get to games. The games that we saw earlier were just the, the odd productions of uh, Gus Bofa, Ferdinand Foe. They were not um, producers of games as a part of their living. But here are, whatever it is, 20 games by Dan Hoeksma. They're not all classic goose games, but they show that he has a genuine uh, interest in the games. And these are all on the, the Italian site that I have developed with my colleague, uh, Luigi Ciompi. It's called giochidelocca.it, and it's got about hmm, two and a half thousand games on it, uh, all with decent images that you can download if you are interested. I can't show you um, all of these games uh, because it would take too long. But let me just show you this. Uh, and this is, in fact, uh, a classic goose game. 
uh, it just with a different layout and it just shows how good uh, Hoxma is at design. But if you look closely, you'll see all the bits that we um, have been talking about. We have on the right, uh, number 58, you probably see it there, um, the death square, the goose is marked as dead, or well, death, death is the, the name of the square. And here, number 52, you have the prison, you have the well, uh, and there is the labyrinth. And so everything is just normal as for, uh, for the game of goose that I first showed you. And I like the little uh, ducklings, uh, well, little goslings uh, who are taking the money out of the winner's pot. But this, I think, is my favourite of Hooksmith's games because of its graphics. It's an advertising game and makes the point that these games are not just to play, or perhaps not even to play. Uh, in Holland, they're often used as advertising probably because uh, people get a nice warm feeling of thinking of a nice cosy game that's been played in the family. And what have they done with it in making an advertisement? What's new? How have they treated the death space and so on? So this game uh, advertises Jan van Verkum's um, jam factory. The jam factory is in fact the winning space in uh, the town called Altena, which is quite close to Arden in uh, northern Holland. And it starts at Nijmegen and it goes from space to space perfectly straightforwardly. It's not a classic goose game. You won't find the number 63, but it's a perfectly comprehensible variant. And it's got some super graphics. Uh, on the left, you'll see the, the cherry. Uh, it, 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 it hitches the lift, goes four spaces forward, uh, saying toot as the car goes on. But my favourite is on the right. And this is, in fact, the equivalent of the death space, uh, begin again at number one. And it's a pair, and the pair has lost, has not produced his passport and can't go past the customs. And you'll see that the, the cherry is very upset about the whole thing. <clears throat> Number four in this list of, of, uh, of greats is Benito Giacobitti from Italy. And his technique, I think, is very different from any of the others. This I like particularly because it's a bit Magritte. The conjurer, instead of producing a rabbit from a hat, simply produces another conjurer. And you can imagine an infinite sequence going on in this way. And you'll see that the conjurer is extremely bold, but nevertheless has a very large comb. This is, this is very Jacobiti. But Jacobiti is best known for these characters, uh, Coco Bill and his horse, uh, Trotter Lemme. Now, Giacovitti is credited with inventing the spaghetti western. I don't know whether that's true, but that's uh, uh, certainly credible given uh, these pictures. And one of the running gags is that Coco Bill, uh, the hero, uh, instead of uh, asking for strong drink, always asks for a chamomile tea, which is why he's juggling a cup and saucer. The horse, uh, which is a fairly degenerate sort of horse, um, is always smoking. So we find that this is a sort of running gag through all of uh, Jacobiti's work. Jacobiti produced these characters in uh, comic books. Uh, this is one called Coco Bill. Um, it says Coco Bill is the, the dude on the horse who rides into this uh, southern city at dawn. He says, Mondo Pistola, the world of Pistol World. And the characters, one of whom is knitting, as you see, says this chap looks as if he's going to liven up 
the day. Instead of which, he says, I'm going to get me a nice chamomile tea while the horse keeps smoking. But no such luck. Cockerbill is recognized and bang, bang, bang. So a game produced by Jacobiti. Well, more than one. Uh, I think we've now got one, two, three, four, five, 25 games, and there's some more on the next page. And these are all <clears throat> quite complicated, uh, and I shall only show you one of them. <laughs> it's the game of the Kiki di Coco, uh, which is a nice thing to be able to say in Italian, and quite different from the others. It doesn't really tell a story. What it is, is a whole series of single cartoons making jokes about Christmas and the time around Christmas. I'm just going to pick out three. Uh, I don't think I understand all of these Italian jokes anyway. But the one on the top left, number six, he says, no, boss, uh, I don't want a panettone. I want just a nice chamomile tea, a big one. And then at the end on the right, uh, number nine, we've got uh, a fairly standard sort of uh, trope in, uh, in games of the new year, the old year and the new year meeting. But here, the new year says, uh, asks the question, and the answer comes back, no, sir, I am not the old year. He is, in fact, convict number 1963. And bottom left, you see a, a, a bit of uh, wacky humor again from Jacobiti. This poor man has produced an Easter egg marked Happy Christmas. And his, his wife says, gosh, you're the usual <laughs> pasticcione, you're the usual big uh, big messy tart. So that's the that's the underlying story of uh, uh, Jacobiti. It's a sort of running gag, series of running gags about the idea of Christmas and uh, the New Year. Last lap, George Velinsky, and Velinsky is known, I think, most particularly for uh, the uh, work that he did for the uh, uh, journal Harakiri, which calls itself, as you see, um, Journal Bet et Méchant, um, stupid and naughty uh, uh, journal. Now, Harakiri ran until, 16, uh, until 1970, when <clears throat> it made the mistake of satirizing General de Gaulle's death. De Gaulle was the president, much loved in France and particularly by the authorities, and Harry Harakiri was closed down in 1970. And of course, immediately it started up again as Charlie Hebdo. And uh, Wilinski produced a great deal of material for Charlie Hebdo. You might be able to see at the bottom that I've pinched this image from Gallica, which is the image database of the uh, French National Library. And if you want to see, I don't know, there must be nearly 100 or more um, uh, uh, cartoons by um, uh, Velinsky, you can log on there. Uh, here he's saying, um, uh, Friends of Nature, uh, nature lovers uh, read Charlie Hebdo, and uh, uh, the, the man is saying there's another nuclear center in my neighborhood. But let's have a look at the game. The game is the Jeu de Loi, a game of the goose, but it's a sexy one. And when we look at it, we shall see uh, how it works. It's just a straightforward spiral of 63. But he hasn't really made much attempt to turn it into a standard goose game. It's really all about sexy graphics. And you'll see uh, various people chasing each other and various geese 
chasing and being chased. Um, the, the well at number 31 uh, has uh, a naked bottom sticking out of it and uh, uh, various views are to be had. Um, this shows that he has made some attempt to make it into a goose game because at number 52, you'll see there, uh, we have a goose in prison, which is the correct uh, space uh, for it to be on. Um, and there is indeed uh, a, a death space with death uh, as, uh, at the top there with a sigh. But in general, the uh, attitude is very much of the cartoonist rather than the maker of a game. And indeed, when we look at this observation, it says there are a lot of possibilities which are um, implied by these rules. And you're all young and uh, beautiful and good health, red cheeks, shining eyes. And it's pretty clear that before very long, you'll be thinking that there are better things to do, more urgent than to arrive at the winning space number three. And you've let the dice roll under the beds. Bravo, you've won. So we have another satirical approach to the game itself. So there we are. There are our five uh, cartoonists. And it's interesting to me that the ones from France are, have all in some way satirized the game. Fernand Faux saying, play the dice, we'll play it with dice which have no pips. Gus Popar saying, kick the dice around the game. And if you think it's stupid, you can leave. Wilinski saying, you've better things to do. Uh, get on the bed and kick the dice underneath it. Whereas Hoxma and Jacobiti are to some extent earning a living by making these games and therefore have a different attitude. Quite a lot of information is on the website uh, of Lambic, which is the big uh, comic shop in, uh, in Holland, I think in Amsterdam. But that's really bringing me to the end. Great. Thank you, that was great. Uh, if you have any questions for Adrian or comments, you can drop your name in the chat or just um, unmute yourself. Uh, any questions? I always thought that part of the um, the idea of a game was that the toss of the dice was to represent fate, like fate was actually um, demonstrated by the game. But uh, are there games where the end is not inevitable? I mean, most board games, at least these come to an end. And it's, and uh, in other words, can you avoid the end of these games? Are you not, are you not supposed to avoid that, that kind of, uh, I predestined I, fate. I try not to play these games. Oh, okay. uh, people, people always say to me, you know, you must enjoy playing these games. And I say, look, these are stupid games. If you want to play something, let's play backgammon for money. Um, but on one occasion, I was uh, with uh, a girlfriend on the west coast of uh, your lovely country. And uh, we taken a goose game for the children. And the children weren't in the least interested in playing a game of this kind, but their father was and insisted on playing it. So the three of us sat down and played this game and much against my better judgment. And we all three in turn hit the death space so that we all started back at the beginning. And that to me was the nearest that fate had ever come to say, please do not play this game. Yeah, I see what you mean. Right. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't. I, I assume that there is still an industry of games, even though a lot of children are playing video games that don't have this kind of linear narrative. You can go all kinds of places. Oh know, yes, and... I mean the the in <laughs> don't know where to start. In Germany, there is a culture of of board games. I think it's it happens when people go to college, and they go around for a drink and they play a board game together and this lasts into adulthood there's a, a well uh, promoted and televised uh, game of the year competition and uh, the games are uh, games are really very big business yes uh, they are more complicated than the simple uh, roll and move games indeed uh, they have all sorts of uh, uh, arrangements not just um, different pathways but choice of move a lot of interesting and expensive uh, equipment um, cards uh, things that you can uh, touch and feel making the game feel good as well as look good is is important mm. there's a question for michael dooley you can unmute yourself okay thanks uh, yeah, I I was just curious about well, my, my question: To what extent uh, were the games by each of these five cartoonists popular in their times and, and places, and why? I tried to uh, establish, I guess, basically the audience for for these cartoonists. I mean, you know, it seems like with Walensky, it's not necessarily that people would sit down and play it, but they just didn't enjoy it for its narrative uh, comic book aspect. So I was wondering if you could if you could discuss the, the relationship between uh, these people and their uh, audiences like, you know, is is there one that's like super popular compared compared to the rest or uh, how would you describe it? The game by Fernand Faux uh, is for um, an audience that's pretty intellectual, doesn't want to play the game, but wants to treat the, get the sheet as a conversation piece. I mean, there was huge interest in this story of uh, 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 Therese. Um, there were many people in government many uh, rich people the whole uh, of, of paris is an exaggeration but there were many people who were caught up in this this particular scam and it was um uh, uh, greatly uh, pretty um uh, satirized in the news in the news in ordinary uh, um, comic strips and so on cartoons everywhere so the audience for that would be uh, relatively small, but uh, part of the general reaction to the, the scandals. Uh, Gus Bofa, um, not quite the only game he produced, but he produced another one for La Bayonette, but the audience there would be simply the, the people who uh, had that magazine in the trenches. Um, if we go on to Huxma, I think that's really more difficult. I expect that Hooksmas games <clears throat> were really very, very popular over quite a wide range of, uh, 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 of people, simply because it's the Netherlands and the game is, is highly popular there. And I think he was producing games in response to a market demand. Um, Jacobiti, I think it's more complicated because Jacobiti is a highly popular cartoonist in Italy, and therefore I think uh, his his games are more or less offshoots uh, from his uh, his more general style, and particularly from his uh, spaghetti western um, uh, producers. And as you say, I think Walensky uh, that is a one off, and it's produced um, like any other cartoon that he produces. Uh, it's to be to be laughed at and uh, sniggered at, and and so on. Yeah, I um, I thank you so much. This was so much to so much 
uh, information and, and knowledge that you're giving. I've written, I only knew with uh, Walensky and I've written down the names of the other, of the others that plan to do a lot of uh, <laughs> uh, post uh, event research. And I've also uh, looked at uh, your website, which I'd like to uh, post a, uh, a link to in the, in the, in the uh, chat, because it's just, it's just awesomely overwhelming the amount of information that you yeah. that you have there and so yeah. this is yeah this is going to be a um, a fun game for me to go working my way through that <clears throat> anyway I, I, thanks i would thanks i would like I, I would just warn you that it's very easy to get hooked on these games they are very interesting objects yeah. and uh, i i have been working on them for probably 50 years and have not got to the end yet <laughs> so it, it, the the answer to the question uh, are the games that never finish? I think the study of these games never finishes. <laughs> okay, thank thank you again very much. Looks like uh, Andrew has a question. Uh, yeah, thanks for that great presentation. Um, so I was thinking also along the lines of what Ben was saying um, about games and thinking about them in relationship to narrative and because um, games have rules, but within those rules, there's an enormous amount of contingency and chance that can happen, you know, um, like a football game or a board game. And even like what, you know, Wittgenstein talked about language games, right? Where there's like sort of grammar, but then you know, um, and it's interesting also that even in, in fiction now, like people are playing with, well, it's not just, it's been going on for a while, but like, like there's a writer named Sheila Hetty who just wrote a, a work of memoir and fiction where she uses the I Ching to, um, to think about the relationship between a game and fiction. And, yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. Uh, I mean, if you if you broaden it out to all games, the possibilities are huge. But the def the, the very definition of a game, <clears throat> which has been thought about a lot, really says that a, a game is some activity that uh, uh, people undertake um, in a voluntary way and subject themselves to rules uh, in circumstances that they otherwise would not. And that's a very broad definition of a game, but it shows how central uh, to the idea of a game uh, the fact of rules uh, actually is. And so when you get these uh, cartoonists actually satirizing the rules, so that the dice have got no pips or you kick them round, um, th they're actually um, a, a clawing away at the very foundation of what we think of as a game. Uh, and of course, there are, the, there are games in which um, the, the game is to determine the rules from seeing it played. Uh, I mean, it's a, it, it's a huge field. Yeah, that's an, can I say something else? Sure. sure. Yeah, and because that's interesting how you said a game, because there was a philosopher I always liked reading, Richard Rorty, and he said, new art is created by learning the rules as you create the game. Yeah. And that's kind of like, sounds like what you're saying. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Anybody else? Well, since this is a, comics and picture story symposium, I guess the question of whether these games were, um, how they play, or what part they play in the history of multi-panel narrative uh, diagrams. And um, because, I mean, some of them, uh, Although they're not fully, they sort of assume you know, I guess, the story, but they are like a graphic representation. 
but just as a, as a purely the um, the uh, mechanism of a multi-paneled uh, picture story, how they intersect with the history of comics. I mean, we don't. Well, it's it's difficult for me because I don't know enough about the history of comics. Right. Um, the what I do know is that the <clears throat> the game that I showed you right at the beginning um, is. That one should do that. That should do that. Oh, I just wanted to go back um, to the long way. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, there we are. <clears throat> now, this game is actually in interpretable as the story of a human life, uh, more accurately, the progress of the soul. Um, and uh, there's really quite good evidence that we are talking here uh, about the um, uh, positive things, the geese being representatives of divine help and things like the inn representing earthly pleasures, uh, the well being a disaster that you've fallen into. Death is death of the soul, not death as such. And it means that you start again. So bearing in mind, this is a medieval game, which is really where the, these ideas would take root. Um, and there would be pictures on the game. You're really starting very early in the 15th century uh, with um, uh, pictures representing some sort of a, a narrative. So that it's, uh, it, it's, it's clearly a very early source. Right. And that, I mean, yeah, birth to uh, death or rebirth or whatever, reincarnation is, an, I mean, that is an inevitable story, I guess. But uh, so do these games predate print? Um, they uh, are earlier than uh, <laughs> print with <movie. laughs> but let's be Let's be clear. If we're talking about Gutenberg, well, uh, or wood are, wood block pre movable they, they type. Certainly, I mean, they certainly they don't they don't uh, predate wood block. I mean, wood block is is known in China from. You know, it's a question of when we know it from, rather than well, how old it is. Right. I'm, I uh, guess I meant other hand painted games, not reproduced games. Just uh, oh yes, indeed there are. There are. Yes, okay. there, there are games on manuscript. Yeah. And there are, uh, these, not all of these games are, are printed from um, engraved copper. Uh, woodblock is quite a common, uh, uh, a common thing, or a combination of both. No, it's uh, they are they are very very old. Any other questions or comments? Um, and and what about the gambling? You mentioned there was a whole a gambling aspect to these. Do you really need? I mean, how, how does this facilitate gambling? Is it like a horse race? No, you what you do. Uh, and if you look at that picture I've got up there, you can see see the coins at number sixty three. Right. <clears throat> I think can you not? That's a little that's a little pile of coins. Uh, the, the game is played for stakes of some kind. I've time. unmuted you so you can speak. Sorry. Ah. Hello. Um, the, uh, the gambling aspect, if you land on one of the hazards, you have to pay something into the pool. And at I the see. beginning of the game, everybody puts something into the pool. And That's the it. person who gets exactly to 63 wins uh, the stakes. So this game was uh, very much known for gambling. Um, when it was presented to the court of Philip II of Spain uh, by um, one of the Medici, uh, Philip II's gambler complained that he'd lost, I think, 50 scudi playing at this game and he wished it had never come from Florence. So yeah, so although it might be the progress of the human soul, 
it's also the progress of a fair number of scooby all right looks like a um it looks like the diagram of like a theater like when you buy tickets for something like you kind of click on like seating diagram. seating areas yeah i think david did you have a question yes um it was about a different kind of game which i'm not sure was really a game or whether it's political satire uh, or whether it's actually a serious attempt to give narrative to an impossibly complicated and controverted situation this is this this game i found in a history of the playing card and there is one set of playing cards which go under the title of the uh, popish plot playing cards oh, yeah. yes do you know have you heard of these adrian anyway there yeah, are apparently course. a lot of them made in the 1670s when the popish plots were hot hot stuff were highly debated yeah. and actually highly inflammatory because yeah. you could die for plotting against the life of uh, Charles of, 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 the, of the king yeah. and the whole run up to the plots is actually recounted as a sort of history of the civil war which is curious and when I found these um, this game in the form of playing cards that is one episode on each card I wondered how they were arranged whether they were actually the idea was you were dealt cards and you had somehow to swap them around and make sense of the extraordinary story of the popish plots you know which some of which were real and some of which were invented uh, some of which were in fact uh, fraudulent yeah um, hey, I, and, you know, I, I, so I i'm wondering whether anyone has ever looked at these whether you know this what i'm referring to and whether there's been a serious uh, look at this uh, kind of a game if it really was a game yes i know these very well uh, I, I shouldn't be talking about them because I, I don't do playing cards, but the, <laughs> as far as I know, and I've, I, I think I would know if there was any other interpretation, these are simply um, uh, decorative images, um, and the cards are marked with standard suit marks, and you play any standard game that you like. Um, with those cards, that there is no game which depends upon the um, uh, uh, upon the actual decorative images. Okay. I mean, there are a whole lot of there are a whole lot of playing cards uh, packs of this nature. I mean, you get geographical ones, you get historical ones, uh, you get ones of the South Sea bubble. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a, it, but it's a different industry from from mine. I, 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 co I cover these various subjects in games. Uh, other people cover these various subjects in in, in playing cards. Thank you. Mm. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at them. I see they have the normal markings of hearts and. Uh, diamonds and numbers yeah. on the top. I don't know if all, I mean, the ones I'm looking at, maybe others are designed differently. And even even like playing cards, like I never thought about the design yeah. of a playing card, but the, the colors and the images, they're sort of like seared into a kind of like folk memory or something, you know, like the sort of ace of hearts, the queen of spades, like that's, yeah, I don't know I how I don't know. Yeah. yeah oh. What you're looking what you're looking at is um if you get a standard pack of, of play cards that you use for bridge or for poker, you're looking at a French Rouen pack. I don't know the date because it's not my business to know the dates of playing cards, but that's you're looking at uh probably hmm, where are we 400 years old yeah something like that 
yeah. And they, they've been stylized a bit in the in the interim. Uh, but the, the basically you're looking at uh, 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 an early modern playing card, yeah. Yeah. I suppose that um, Lewis Carroll, when he wrote the Alice stories, was playing on his listeners it's not addiction to games, but curiosity about games and what value they might have. And I think he obviously satirizes the very idea of the game. He really sort of blows yes, that up at the he end. Does. And uh, yeah. Alice is far too intelligent to believe, you know, that mm. she's going to lose her head um, by uh, picking the wrong card, shall we say. Uh, yeah. But it seems to me that there is research there in the in the considerable um, Lewis Carroll, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you've got in the investigation business <laughs> as yes. to the role that playing cards were really playing at this time. Yes, not just playing cards, of course, chess as well. In chess, oh yeah, in in, in chess, yeah, indeed. Uh, Lewis Carroll is also a good example of an adventure without many rules. You know what I mean? Um, like it, oh, well, hmm. I well, mean, I, <laughs> you, you bear it. If you just think about uh, Lewis Carroll as uh, Through the Looking Glass and um, Alice in Wonderland, you will neglect things like the game of logic, which he produced yeah, as well. It's true. No, uh, Carroll was a, basically a, a logician, uh, a mathematical logician, but he's. Uh, sufficiently interested in pushing the boundaries of, uh, of, of logic and particularly of um, verbal expression. I mean, his, uh, his whole Humpty Dumpty thing, you know, the words mean what I choose them to mean, uh, is, is, is pushing the, the boundaries, pushing the envelope. Right. I, I guess going back to playing cards that's also one of these theories of multi-panel you know when you look at a uncut sheet of playing cards you have this dense grid of images so uh, have you ever you, seen an uncut version of the popish plot cards or are they always uh, cut I, I, I don't know i mean i <laughs> you're, you're talking to the wrong man yeah. I, I really, I really don't know. Um, yes. I, sort of I think they if, exist. If you, if they you do. Want, okay. I, it, I think if you looked at the British Museum you might uh, site, find one, yeah. you might find one, or uh, I could look it up for you in in Wilshire and see, <laughs> which I've got, which is the catalogue of the, the the collection. Yeah, um, I'll look that up. I've never seen them uncut, but I guess they do exist. Yeah, maybe I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions about these board games? Okay. Um, thank you. It was a great uh, presentation. I'd never known about all these cartoonists making games, board games. But uh, yeah. it is a fascinating Good. angle well, to there. It's been a pleasure. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody. I know it's really late with yeah. you. Thanks. Know. Thank you. And we'll see you all next week. Yep. Bye bye. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank mm -hmm. you. See you. Bye bye. bye.